Thanks for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rish Outfield. I'm not wearing any pants. And Big Anklevich. Ah! Attention, Kmart shoppers. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume. Uh, vo- oh, yeah, not volume. Sorry. Episode 80. That's it? Just 80? Yeah, just 80. It's a number, right? Yes. Okay, I, I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Welcome to our show. Yay. So we have a story today. That's right. Okay, so today's episode is Open 24 Hours by Edward McEwen. Edward McEwen is a writer and editor specializing in science fiction and fantasy with occasional forays into literary and nonfiction. Ed escaped from New York but his old hometown supplies much of the background to his humorous Lair of the Lesbian Love Goddess shorts. Wait, wait, wait. I'm I'm sorry, what? You heard me. Okay. Don't try and pretend like you haven't read them all. As his new hometown in Charlotte, North Carolina does for his Templar fantasy series. He enjoys a wide variety of interests from ballroom dance to the martial arts and has the good fortune to be married to the talented artist Shelley Kiefer. Ed is represented by the Sweatkey Literary Agency for book-length works. He has also edited the Shah Da anthologies of Rye Tales of the Apocalypse. For more information, check the links in the show notes, or find him on Facebook. Special thanks to Christy Maya and Julie Hoverson for lending their voices to today's story. And today's music is by C.J. Rogers. Check out the links in the show notes. Open 24 Hours by Edward McEwen. Tars Bokhara shuffled down the dusty corridors of the Medicala Museum of Antiquities, heading for the curator's office. Not only did the slender young man have the bad luck to work for the poorest, least prestigious of Coltraxis III's 1,000 museums, he worked for Arne Poundstone. Once hailed as a genius, Poundstone was showered with awards before the High Committee realized he'd stolen most of his work from a junior colleague killed on one of his expeditions. By then, it was too late to undo the honors without calling the whole museum system into question. Better to pack the madman off to where he could do little damage until the sands of history safely covered him. The committee hadn't reckoned with Poundstone's fierce determination to avoid those sands. From the neglected halls of Medicala, he launched assaults on the ivory ramparts of high academia. Always he was driven back, But casualties were often heavy, and Poundstone was never among them. Poundstone sent out ill-equipped and ill-fated expedition after expedition, in the hope of making the big find that would restore his glory. Many a fine young archaeologist ended up in the gullet of some ferocious alien monster, or at the hands of unfriendly natives, bones bleached under forgotten suns, doubtless to confuse future historians." Thoughts of ending up as an exhibit made Bokhara start. He looked about at the Rigelian mummies and Arcturian flayed skins with fresh horror. He'd never wanted to be a historian anyway. On Coltraxis, however, it was either history or waiting tables, especially for a young man from a poor family. After graduation, the assignment pool computer sent him to the Medicala Museum, sentencing him to virtual serfdom until, and unless, he gained tenure. He reached the curator's office and peered in past the automatic doors. Marinda, the department secretary, sat at her desk. Pleasant and middle-aged, she served as his first line of defense against Poundstone. He'd cultivated the older woman with chocolates, flowers, and flattery. She saw through him, but enjoyed the attention. Marinda caught his eye briefly, looking away with a stricken expression. It was over. His defenses had clearly failed. 
the barbarians were over the wall, and all that remained was pillage and slaughter. Go right in, Tars, she said in a low, sad voice. <sighs> He's waiting for you. Don't suppose there is any way out of this one? He asked. <laughs> Mirinda gave a small sob. Bokara squared his shoulders and marched in, determined now to meet his fate without flinching. Entering the immense office, he faced a huge desk, devoid of any useful or relevant work. There could be no question he was in the presence of senior management. Poundstone rose from behind the ornate wooden plateau, walking around to greet him. The curator looked the part of field archaeologist, tall, tanned, with a broad, sloping forehead and intense, dark eyes. He reminded Bokhara of the busts of the ancient emperors and senators from the early days of the Galactic Empire, the human ones, anyway. It was easy to imagine such a face giving orders for a suicide attack by a legion or the firing of a hell burner on a city. History technician level 5 Bokhara reporting is ordered. Excellent, my boy, Poundstone said in a deep, pleasing voice. Good to see you. How's that father of yours? Still dead, sir. Excellent, Poundstone said. Bokhara, today's the day that will define your career. It's field work that makes the historian, I say, how I hate being chained in this office, unable to get back to the field. Yes, sir. You are going to lead an expedition, Poundstone said, a fiendish glint in his eye. An expedition to rediscover old Earth, the wellspring of humanity, lost to us these fifty. 50,000 years since the Great Diaspora after the Cluster War. Bokara blinked in confusion. Earth? Isn't that a myth? Not at all, Poundstone exclaimed, hands cutting through the air. His technagia found coordinates in the gunnery computer records of a Beta Centauri war cruiser salvaged 10,000 years ago. They may well be for old Earth. Poor child, it's a shame about her and those hyper-wolverines on the Vegan expedition. Bokara felt the air empty out of the room. Me lead an expedition, sir? I'm not experienced. <laughs> Poundstone chuckled. Oh, you'll do. It's less a matter of leading the expedition than being the expedition. We're running short of people due to the Vegan and Delton affairs. Those Geniuses in the Prime Museum won't give me the funding for replacements and equipment, so I'm afraid it will just be you. I've booked you a passage on an AI freighter which will divert to the coordinates, then return to pick you up. We also found a human form combat robot in one of the lower storage levels, in an exhibit no one's seen in 400 years. We'll send that with you, if we can get it working. We'll Poundstone kind of continued, so the but the fuzziness of shock put distance between Bokara and the details of his doom. Two months later, Bokara sat in his tiny cabin on the artificial intelligence ship Gumpina closing on an utterly unremarkable G-Class star where the ancient Beta Centauri war cruiser had been wrecked. Gumpina's AI was no longer speaking to him. His first six weeks aboard had been spent in a state of near-total intoxication. Unfortunately, he'd misjudged the raid at which he'd consumed his anodyne, leaving him to face the last two weeks of the voyage in dreadful sobriety. A desperate attempt to cobble together a still from the ship's robot spares had put him and the ship on the outs. Suddenly, the speaker over his head crackled, buzzed, and emitted a toneless feminine voice. Gumpina to passenger, entering far orbit of Class 43B2 type planet. Your personal AI robot is now active and will handle all further communications. The machine's dry voice managed to sound disapproving of his existence. He didn't bother to reply. The door to his small cabin slid open. He looked up with little interest. A machine stood there, far different from the squat ship bots. Slim and graceful, it seemed almost feminine in appearance. Colorless monofilament wire lay like hair on its shoulders. Antennae or heat sink, he assumed. Its rudimentary face, with small, delicate features, at least gave a human eye somewhere to focus when communicating with it. 
He wondered briefly if it looked like the designer's girlfriend. The silver body, intended to reflect energy weapons, badly needed polishing. Dents, discolorations, and melt spots told of hard service. Curiously, it wore a frayed, threadbare black vest with the silver letters AN158909 on it. The machine stopped, its mouth speaker opening. HCR Unit AN158909, Imperial Assault Infantry, 1st of the 71st, reporting as ordered. Great, he said. Hate to break it to you, but you were surplused over 600 years ago. This unit has no other designation. Effective immediately, you're... Anne One of the Medicala Expedition. The robot mulled it over, its reflective silver human-like eyes fastened on him. Affirmative. The ship's AI informs me that we are in a stable orbit, Anne One advised. It requests we disembark as soon as possible. I'll bet, said Bokara. Let's go, Anne One. We know when we aren't wanted. They made their way to the ship's only shuttle. Anne One climbed into the pilot seat and, pulling some leads from compartments in its body, jacked into the small vessel's computer. Bokara plunked into the chair behind Anne One. The robot started the engines, and Gumpina's shuttle kicked free, heading planetward like a meteor. Bokara sighed, <sighs> then peered over Anne One's metal shoulder at the monitor screen. He expected to see a dead world, or a primitive, savage wilderness. To his shock, the night side of the world ahead was lit up like a Penelian fire tree at holiday. And one, give me scanner readings. Affirmative. Readings indicate the presence of multiple energy sources on the planet. Detecting artificial light in visible spectrums, infrared sensors show multiple heat sources inconsistent with volcanic origins. Apart from oceans and the polar regions, the surface is covered by what appears to be a structure of approximately 10 to 20 meters in height. There are some open spaces which appear to be filled with transports. Much of the building's surface is lit in geometric patterns. The whole planet? He said, in awed disbelief. One big building? And one, steer for a landing on a clear area somewhere on that northern continent where the lights are the thickest. Any sign of people? Any communications? Negative to both queries. They landed on a staging area for aircraft and hover cars. Machines lay around in decrepit heaps. Clearly, it had been ages since any of them had flown. They peered through the canopy at a massive field of neon and electric signs. Damn, Bokara said. Forgot to activate my implant. He found the proper mental vibe and triggered the psychotronic computer link. Uh, language protocol upload. He sub-vocalized to Gumpina's AI. Translate. No immediate match available. It whispered directly into his mind. Continuing to process. And one secured the small vessel's drives while he checked the atmospheric sensors. Humanity's old home, if this was indeed it, still welcomed her children. Excitement overcame him. Old Earth at last. He cycled open the lock. Wet, cool air rushed in, followed by a two-meter-tall, blue, yellow, and green chitinous horror, waving antennae and claws. Bokara screamed, backpedaling, snatching at his stunner. He lost his footing and the weapon, tumbling onto Anne One as the HCR rushed to his aid. She raised scratched silver arms to ward off the horror. The monstrous insect drew itself up to its full height, compound eyes glaring. Welcome to Earthmart! It bellowed. Open 24 hours! Whoa, whoa, what? He stammered. Welcome to Earthmart! The insect repeated. Where the customer is king! Open 24 hours for your shopping convenience! The translation, the translation program, program, he thought, is totally screwed. Do you understand me? He ventured when the creature did not attack. Earthmart understands the customer's wants and needs. Your accent is awfully funny, though. Of course, who am I to say? You are the first customer we've had on the planet in 5,000 years. It doesn't want to eat me, he muttered. And one took it as a question. Insufficient data. However, imminent hostility is not apparent. Well, of course not, sir, the insect sputtered. The customer is king at Earthmart, not an hors d'oeuvre. 
the translation program finally flashed an identification of the creature on his interior eye surface. Paraplaneta Americana, a.k.a. the American Cockroach. Pardon my asking, he said, slowly reaching for the fallen stunner. Are you a cockroach? Yes, sir. One of the last four original species left. Well, well, five, I guess, now that you are back. I am the greeter for the greater Northeast area. It's an honor to meet you. Please enter our store, oh credit-worthy one. Bokara studied the creature before him. Now that he was not in mortal danger of being devoured, he had leisure to take in the details. Greeter was shiny brown. The blue and yellow were a vest and four-legged pants. Um, perhaps my information is obsolete, but aren't cockroaches about this big? He said, waving his pinky. That was in ancient days, Greeter said. After you humans left, our evolution sped up. Nature abhors a vacuum. We like to joke that the boys in housewares abhor them too, it added conspiratorially. Do you have a name? Bokara asked, holstering his stunner. The insect replied with a series of cracking and snapping sounds. <laughs> well, said Bokara, my translation program didn't make anything out of that. Can I call you Greeter? The customer is always right at Earth Mart. Bokara took that as a yes. Hey, Greeter said, taking an interest in Anne One. Did you go to some other part of the store? Where did you get that? Toys or home electronics? Anne One was somehow miffed. I was constructed at the Omega Ram facility on Negal 6 as a human form combat robot 1,738 years ago. I was surplused due to obsolescence 496 years later. That's too bad, Greeter said. If you'd gotten it here, we could have offered you a trade-in. No, Bokara said. And one is fine with me. She's my crew. Wow, Greeter enthused. Two customers. Oh, I'm in the history books for sure. Speaking of which, said Bokara, I'm a history technician. Old Earth's been lost to galactic history for millennia. I'm on a mission to rediscover it, to learn its history. Please, take me to your leader. You want to see the store manager? Greeter said. Is there something wrong? No, no, Bokara said. I'm interested in, uh, in the store's history. How it's run, what sells. All right, sir, Greeter said. But it will be quite a journey. It's a long way to the manager's office. I'll take you if you want to go. We'd have to use the store transit, sir. I've never been up in an aircraft before. I wouldn't know how to direct you. And one, can we use the shuttle in atmosphere? Bokara asked, nervous about disappearing into the bowels of the planetary building. Ill-advised without exact coordinates. This model shuttle is not designed for long atmospheric transits. Fuel is limited. Best we get going, the giant roach said, scuttling back out of the airlock. Come on, Anne, Bokara added before his nerves got the better of him. We're off. This unit should remain and secure the shuttle. No, obsolete or not, you are coming with me. I like the thought of having a combat robot along. Hey, do you still have any of your onboard weaponry? Affirmative. I am armed with three millimeter lasers in each index finger, stunners in the ring fingers, and palm blades in both hands. Anne, I think I love you. This unit is not a pleasure model, she replied primly. Hey, how come you didn't shoot Greeter? All weapons are on safe. Damn, I should have spent some time reading your manual. Oh well, it worked out for the best. You would probably have barbecued our native guide. Target acquisition was compromised by your flailing about. He ignored the criticism. How do I take off the lock? Anne One turned her silvery posterior to him, pulling back the collar of the vest she used for pockets. An access panel popped open. Press the red button three times. He did so. Let's go. Don't kill anyone unless I tell you to. Acknowledged. As they exited the shuttle, Bokara stared around. Sol was up, though it was still cool under the bright blue sky. All around stood garish signs, no less eye-hurting in daylight. His translation program rendered the writings, flashing them onto the inside of his eyes. It didn't mean much to him. ATM in-building, easy terms, inventory reduction on the red dot. 
In the distance, over the hoods of decayed air cars, he saw a line of glassed windows. Greeter waved them over, and they quickly caught up to the insect. Despite the trot, and one's feet made no more sound than did his. Of course, he thought, a combat robot would be able to sneak up on things. They followed Greeter through the automatic doors and into the planet building's immense, erratically lit interior. At least it was cooler inside. Is it all like this? Bokara wondered, looking down an aisle with shelves on both sides that seemed to recede into infinity. The whole planet is just one big store? Greeter looked at them. Sure. Well, there are some ancient inventories and cash receipts suggesting that at one time there were multiple marts. The wall, the pets, the K, the stein, maybe a few others. Th th there was also something called government. The mart seemed to have bought it out and closed it down. When they all kind of ran into each other, there came the great merger and Earth Mart was born. A planet-sized store, Bokara muttered. Oh, to tell the truth, Greeter continued, there's a lot of interest in the old marts these last few years, kind of a fundamentalist revival. Some folks believe the reason all the customers left was because we mart personnel departed the true way of sales. They say we could never be found, didn't know anything about what we sold, had the same stuff in every sub-store, things like that. They want to resurrect the old labels and signs. Wouldn't be so bad, except for the occasional sacrifice of an unlucky store clerk by fundamentalists. The Order of the Blue Light special, though. Ooh, they're the worst. Greeter Ooh, prattled on, me. pointing to sale special items and specials on the dusty years. shelves. Bokara was awestruck by the amount and variety of historical artifacts. Thousands of boxes lined the shelves, with labels hinting at the treasures within. They walked on and on, eventually coming to a group of smaller cockroaches, swarming over the shelves, taking boxes labeled tampons from the top and placing them on the bottom, while others took identical boxes from the bottom shelves and put them on the top. They stopped what they were doing to cluster around a nervous Bokara and a watchful Anne One. Restocking crew, Greeter explained. Not the deep end of the gene pool. We try to keep them away from customers. Not that it's been a problem in the last 5,000 years. Back, back, Greeter cried as the others swarmed near. Don't annoy the customers. We're off to see the store manager. The insects backed away, bowing as they did so. Kids, dumb as rocks. But we don't even have to pay the minimum wage. They cut through several other aisles to find an open area under some brilliant arc lights, about half of which functioned. Monorail cars stood parked nearby. Greeter checked several until he found one working. Bokara piled in with Anne One behind him. The car raced down the railway, blurring the interior of the store's departments and aisles. Earth Mart offers all the latest conveniences, Greeter said. Now, uh, I hate to mention this to customers, but there is an occasional teensy bit of interdepartmental rivalry going on at Earthmart. Uh, you see, the last customer who came through here was an Arcturian. Boy, what a hard sell he was. Insisted we didn't have anything he wanted. Ill-tempered, too. He kept vaporizing employees. Everybody tried to sell him something. Finally, he broke down and bought a back scratcher from a cockroach, a direct ancestor of mine. That was quite a coup, seeing as he didn't have a back. Naturally, the other species, the rats and pigeons, were kind of upset. Of course, we cockroaches are natural salesmen. Ever since then, we've had the cream of the positions at Earth Mart. Unfortunately, it's led to some professional jealousy. Suddenly, their cart slowed. Uh-oh, Greeter said. I think I should have gone through women's underwear. What's wrong? Bokara demanded, hand on his stunner. Greeter's body twisted as he tried to look in several directions at once. I think I took us too close to fishing and camping. The car pulled off onto a sidetrack and stopped. The shelves here were full of fishing poles, cooking gear, sleeping bags and such. It was also full of rats, human-sized ones. Each wore blazing orange vests, camouflage pants, and furred hats. Some seemed to be carrying weapons. Now listen, Greeter called from his position crouched down in the front seat. We ain't looking for trouble. These are our customers. I'm taking them to the store manager. Button it, Roach, snapped a particularly large rat. 
He wore the blaze vest and hat with the addition of a set of rubber-looking pants that went to his chest. Nothing goes on in Earthmont that we rats don't know about. Just like you roaches trying to hijack the first customers in millennia. Greetings, customer, the rat said, turning to Bokara. I'm sure this squishy bug has been filling your ears with all sorts of lies. We rats are delighted to see you. We can fulfill your every need for the outdoors. Uh, you don't have an outdoors, Bokara said. This seemed to throw the rat. Well, uh, what about if I, um, asked the desperate rat. A what? Bokara asked, looking anxiously at his own arms. One of the rats leveled a wood and metal tube at a display of lamps. Its fingers worked the weapon. It gave an ear-splitting crack, and a bunch of lamps shattered. Ah! Bokara yelped and ducked. And one jerked upright, her arms pointed at the rats. Hey, the leader of the pack said, staring at Anne One. Did you guys stop in a toy department? No, Bokara shouted. She's with me. She's a customer, too. Confirmed, Anne One added. The rat smiled. How about a camouflage nighty for the little lady? A loud whooping sound made them all jump. No, a rat screamed. Blue light special! Bokara spun in his seat. From across the open floor of occasional furniture came a horde of rats and roaches. Each bore on its back a vertical pole, atop which pulsed a circular blue light. Below that sat a speaker, emitting the dreadful whooping. The creatures shrieked, As they charged, blaze-clad rats fell back from the cart in confusion. A shower of brilliant objects flew from the hands of the blue light fundamentalists. Coleman Lantern attack! yelled the lead rat. Jeez, our own damn merchandise! And one threw herself on Bokara, pinning him down. Bullets banged off her body. A lantern bounced off her back. She rose and laser fire licked out of her fingers. Fundamentalists and sales rats fled. More guns banged. Speakers whooped. Lights flashed. We've got to get out of here! Bokara screamed to greet her. This way! The roach dropped to all six for more speed. Bokara stunned a rat clutching at his sleeve and hopped out of the cart following Greeter. Anne One trailed, still firing and beginning to slow as heat built up in her. Anne One, cease fire! Bokara yelled, unwilling to leave his metallic companion behind. Engage only enemy personnel chasing us! They raced away through acres of home and garden toward men's furnishings. Anne One began slowing again, heat building up from the run. Sir, Anne One said, I am overheating. My coolant pack is near empty. I need lubrication. What? Bokara said. Wasn't it full? Last filled during regular maintenance before I was surplused. I have not had regular maintenance since. Oh, Bokara groaned. Hundreds of years ago? I really should have read your manual. An attentive owner would have, And one said, with an air of deep disappointment. I'm sorry, Bokara said. Well, we could stop in automotive. Greeter offered. But it's on the other side of haberdashery. We don't want to go there. We have to, Bokara said. And one needs help. Okay, sir, Greeter said in resignation. They made their way into the racks of suits and coats, dust billowing up as they bumped into them. <coughs> Bokara sneezed several times. <coughs> Greeter waved his upper limbs, trying to shush him. Quiet! You don't want the tailors to... A mass of white stuff flopped right onto Greeter's head. He made several disgusted sounds. <laughs> oh, dreadfully sorry. A prissy voice came from above. They looked up to see an impeccably dressed pigeon of about 60 pounds sitting atop the highest stack of shelves. <laughs> you did that on purpose! Greeter howled. He pulled a set of pants off the shelf to wipe his head. You no good bug! The pigeon shrilled, flapping in aggravation. That's Italian silk! You'll get an interdepartmental charge off for that. Charge this! Greeter pointed at his lower rear. The pigeon squawked in outrage. Oh, boys, get that bug spray we got in the house and garden. No! Greeter cried. Bokara fired his stunner. The avian haberdasher plummeted into a pile of sweaters with a thump. Flapping and cooing, a flock of pigeons burst over a rack of sports coats. a weapon, razor-sharp measuring tapes, garrots of plastic thread, or foot-long needles. And Bokara shouted, turning to fire. Take them out! 
the trusty HCR spun and began skeeting Taylors out of the air. Steam rose from Anne One's hair as she quickly overheated. Stunned and barbecued pigeons crashed into racks. Survivors fled. Thank you, sir, said a fervent greeter. Bug spray's been outlawed in interdepartmental warfare for a, a thousand years. It would have been the end for me, for sure. No problem, Bokara said, hands shaking as he holstered the stunner. Is it much further to the manager's office? Not much, said Greeter. The other side of automotive. Free of the tailors, they made their way to automotive. Boy, oh boy, us cockroaches do it again. This counts as a sale, Greeter said, handing Anne one both antifreeze and lubricant. Not optimal, Anne one said, examining the material. Her metallic face was incapable of expression, but Bokara sensed disdain. Uh, Greeter, Bokara said, I think I left my wallet back in the shuttle. No problem, sir. We'll run you up a store credit card. It gets you 10% off on all purchases. Thanks. Anne is my ticket home. He patted her silvery posterior. May I remind you, Anne one said, I am not that type of robot. Oh, come on, Anne. It must have felt good to be in the thick of things again. Lasers blazing, enemies falling around you. Don't say I don't know how to show a girl a good time. I am a robot, not a girl. I feel no such emotions. Come on, he said. You were smiling back there in men's furnishings. Sir, Anne protested. I don't have any lips. He sighed. <sighs> Pity about that. Of course, Anne one added. If we were to survive and you were to buy me, I could be upgraded to multifunctionality. Anne, get me back to the shuttle after this, skin intact, and you have a deal. No need to return to the shuttle with a known destination. I can remote pilot the shuttle to our location. Can you cook? He asked. I think I want to marry you. I've noted that the loyalty of humans, particularly males, seems to evaporate when a newer model with a better CPU or additional RAM comes along. Dangle a few enhancements in front of a human male and he is gone. You're obsolete and on a tramp freighter. <sighs> Computers, Bokara sighed. Always making you pay for the last user. And I'm sincere. We'll see, the robot replied, finishing her self-repairs. If you are ready to go, Greeter said, there's a slide walk through neutral territory in the toy department. It should get us to the manager's office. They followed Greeter to the slide walk and stepped on carefully. It whisked them through a long series of hallways. The store's character began to change. It became cleaner, better lit, and more ordered. Management country. Greeter said, rubbing his antennae in what appeared to be a nervous gesture. Don't come here real often, no siree. Not very healthy for a worker. Okay, here's where we get off. They exited the slide walk and walked on plush carpet toward what looked like offices. Looks like word may have gotten out that we were coming, Greeter said, looking around at a series of empty desks. They reached a wood and brass door. On it were the words, Store Manager. Okay, folks, Greeter said, shaking slightly. If you don't mind, I I'm going to wait out here. Thank you, Greeter, Bokara said, closing a hand on his stunner. And let's go. They opened the door slowly. Come in, called a voice. Bokara walked in with Anne one on his heels. A weird sense of deja vu struck him. The office was immense. A desk of similar scale faced him, completely devoid of anything that looked like work. With a free son of fear, he realized he was not only in the presence of management, but senior management. Behind the desk sat a large, ornate leather chair, its back to them. Slowly, it swung around to reveal its occupant, a tabby house cat the size of a small tiger. Meow, it said. Ah, uh, Bokara managed. Just kidding, the cat added. I've always wanted to do that. Welcome to Earth Mart, it said, though the yellow eyes held no friendliness. My name is Bob. I'm Earth Mart's senior store manager. Have a seat, human. 
It gestured to the overstuffed fine leather chairs in front of its desk. Bokara slipped into a seat. and stood behind him. I'm history technician Tars Bokara from the Medicala Museum of Antiquities. I've been sent to locate Old Earth and study her history. So, humans have finally remembered us. Disappeared to the stars, you did. Took the damned dogs with you. Left us cats, as always, to mind the house. What? Bokara said. Who was it who made the world into one big house? Let the rats, roaches, and pigeons in. If it wasn't for us, the whole place would be in chaos, a ruin. Thank you, Bokara said, eyeing the claws flashing in and out of Bob's dinner plate-sized pads. What did we cats get for this? You didn't even leave us any decent trees for scratching. You paved over half the oceans. Nice job, humans. Bob's tail swished. He leaned forward in his chair, rising as if he might leap. Hey, Bokara said, raising his hands. I had nothing to do with it. And one stepped around the chair, palm blades extended in imitation of the agitated cat's claws. Cats aren't bugs, rats are brainless pigeons. Bob hissed, glaring at Anne One. We tried to organize when you left, build a society. What did you leave for us as a model? Earth Mart. So we kept it going through the centuries. Imagine running a store without customers for millennia. The pointlessness, the ennui of it. That's what you condemned us to. So, Bob growled, humans are back and I've fulfilled the dream of my ancestors by telling you off. All right, human, what now? What do you want to do? Bokara thought for a second. He'd been jumping to management's whips his whole life. The future had only promised more of the same. Until now. I want to buy out the store, Bokara replied, settling back in his chair and placing his feet up on Bob's chest. Meow? Bob said, shocked out of his outrage and the power of speech. You've got a planet full of historical artifacts, Bokara said, intent and inspired. I've got a planet full of museums. If I return and just make a report, this place will be looted like the Antarian pyramids. You'll get nothing. Make me your exclusive agent for the removal of antiquities, and I will put Earthmart in the black like it's never been. You guys haven't changed a bit, Bob said, disgust and curiosity warring in his feline face. Think of it! I can put you on the map. You'll be up to your whiskers in milk. M milk? Bob interrupted, eyes wide. Did I say milk? Bokara said. I meant cream. Cream. Bob repeated, his eyes closing in imagined ecstasy. Oh. There's more. Bokara added. Tell me. Tell me. Bob cried. Catnip. <laughs> Bob purred like a hover car engine. Okay, you've got a deal. Bokara smiled and extended a hand. Shake on it? Oh, actually, Bob said, could you scratch behind my ears instead? Tara's Bokara sat in his office atop the main tower of Museum Prime, looking out a bay window at a beautiful day. Clouds scudded across a rose-colored sky, driven by stiff fall breezes. He rested his feet on an immense desk, devoid of any work. A chime sounded, demanding his attention. He waved an indolent hand over control. The door slid open. Outside sat his staff, busy at their desks. At the closest desk sat a giant cockroach. Greeter waved an antenna at Bokara. A beautiful woman strode in through the open door. Night black hair cascaded down her shapely shoulders to her waist. At least at first glance it looked like a beautiful woman. Anne One's combat chassis and CPU had every upgrade known, and a few made just for her. She had lips now, full and sensuous, like her figure. Her artificial skin glowed with health. 
Her eyes were a cool jade green. Here are the latest reports on the sales of artifacts through the Galactic Arm, she said. We even have requests from the Imperial Museum on Gal Central itself. Excellent, Anne, excellent. How's the old chassis today? Guess you'll have to wait until tonight to find out, she replied. That is, if you're good. <laughs> he laughed. Anything else? Yes, Dr. Poundstone just sent in his report on the history of the Odiferous Slugworts on Benicia 7. He says they don't have one. Tell him to keep at it, Bokara said. A little more digging and I'm sure he'll come up with something. As I always say, field work makes the historian. His hollow monitor bleeped with an incoming hyperlight call. He thumbed the button and an image appeared over his desk. Hey, Tars, Bob said. Got the figures on the latest freighter load ready. Bob, how's my favorite manager? Dining on cream and catnip, just like you promised. And Earthmark? Bob grinned his biggest Cheshire grin. Open 24 hours. Author's Note. Hello, this is Edward McKellen. I'm the author of Open 24 Hours. I was delighted to hear that the uh, Dunsteef players, as I think of them, were going to do my story, because it gave me a chance to call in and uh, tell you a little bit about how the story came into being, and also to connect, correct the various pronunciations of my name in the first story that they did. I go by Edward McKellen, also answered Edward McKellen, because that's sometimes easier around people. I don't think I've ever heard as many different variations as you all came up with the last time, but uh, I certainly enjoyed hearing them anyway. Open 24 Hours is one of the first stories that I ever wrote, and it came out of a joke that I told at a party about uh, Walmart and PetSmart and Kmart all colliding and calling World and, and uh, creating WorldMart. And a um, friend said to me, you know, that was pretty good, but you really ought to write a story about that. And I sat down, thought about it, and... But yeah, you know, that has some uh, some comedic potential. So, thus was born Open 24 Hours, which was originally published by Planet Magazine a number of years ago. And now will be done by the Dunsteef players, and uh, nobody's looking forward to that more than me. I can hardly wait to hear what they do with it, having had such fun with the first piece that they did. All right, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that story. So, Lair of the Lesbian Love Cats. <laughs> now, is is this a bad place that you wouldn't want? Because I mean, a lair seems like a that seems like a dangerous place. That's true. If she's a lesbian love goddess, she might not want you hanging around her lair. Well, there is that. She's not a bisexual love goddess. She's just a lesbian love goddess. So you're really not welcome, Rish. But you know. Just between you and me, if she was a heterosexual nymphomaniac love goddess, I still wouldn't be welcome. Yeah, I suppose that's pretty much the case. Ah, uh, well. All right, Tars Bokara. This story, a certain percentage of the listenership will absolutely loathe the cockroach voice. We'll find it to be the most annoying voice ever. <laughs> and I, I don't know. Should I be worried about that? <laughs> I don't know. It is, I'm trying to think of a nice word for it. Uh, <laughs> Uh-oh. It's a fun voice. It may be one that might be hard to listen to for long periods of time, but I don't know. I, I, you've made a reputation for being a funny guy, so hopefully people will find it funny. And if they don't? Then they aren't hearing us talk right now because they're long gone. I hadn't even thought of that. Okay, well, thank you for uh, reassuring me. I had a blast doing all the voices. You know, we did pigeon voices, we did the cockroach, we did the cat, uh -huh. we did the rats, uh, as well as robot, uh, computer AI, so on and, and so and forth. Yeah, like, it was it, there was a lot of fun stuff to to do in that story, and the best part was you could just let it all hang out, you could just let it go because these weren't serious characters; they were crazy, goofy, fun characters. You know. It's like Clob, you know, we talked about how that was one of my favorite voices to do not too long ago, and that was the reason why, because you could just let it hang out and go. You didn't have to uh, worry about 
being able to cry in that voice or something like that. I hear you. What about portraying a character called Tars <laughs> Bokara? It's much easier than the time that I had to portray Lars Ulrich, so... Sorry, I, I was far away. I was in the lair of the lesbian love uh, goddess there from there. Back in that again, huh? Yeah, I don't know. Tars Bokara is far future space names. Is Tars Bokara better than Han Solo or Buck Rogers? Hmm. Wasn't Buck Rogers from the far away future of 1987? <laughs> or, or is he better than Romo Lamkin from uh, Battlestar Galactica, huh? The heck do you remember that name? But you were always <laughs> able to remember Romo Lamkin. Yeah, there was something about it. I think it's because it makes me think of Lambert the Sheepish Lion. <laughs> sing the song. <laughs> no, you can't sing that song because you have to do that bang sound. That's If you thought the cockroach voice chased people away, <laughs> just wait till I start singing Lambert the Sheepish Lion. Well, I found this episode to be a lot of fun. We, you and I were talking about what we wanted to do, and, and you were talking about space opera. And I know this isn't what you were talking about or what you were intending. But, you know, the far future, uh, running into friendly aliens and, you know, sexy robots and stuff like that. That's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty cool. It is cool. It's similar to what I was talking I mean, I was hoping for, when I said I was hoping for some good space opera, I was thinking more. You know, something serious, something, I guess it would be Star Trek-like or Star Wars-like or something along those lines, but those things have become such a huge deal, you know what I mean? They're almost like a classification just themselves. You say a Star Trek story or something, you're obviously going to have a lot of parody-type stories and this wasn't a parody of star trek but it was a comical story in that kind of a, a universe where the universe is already explored and they've gotten to the point where they've forgotten earth and they've got to go back and discover it and you know it's just just something that you're going to get probably a fair amount of i would guess i haven't written one myself but then again i've only written about six stories all time so that doesn't say much. One of the first stories you wrote that I read, Earth was destroyed. In, so I think. <laughs> okay. I, I mean, unless that was supposed to be a current modern day it was thing, I assumed that that was supposed to be somewhat in the future. It was only supposed to be a 20 or 30 years from now kind of a future, though. So. Well, you remember, gosh, six months ago where I said, hey, we need to mention Firefly every other episode. Uh -huh. And if we don't, People need to remind us. I don't think we've talked about Firefly in a long, long time. But in that one, wasn't it like 500 years from now and Earth was just a uh, a myth or, you know, some old story? I think it was just a used um, up Hulk kind of a thing, you know. We'd, we'd hollowed it out to the point that it was worthless. And so they had to uh, move on. And so it was just Earth that was. Was Earth still out there somewhere and it was just uninhabitable or did we ever get an answer on that? I don't think we ever got an answer on that. They just called it Earth that was and left it at that. So Earth could have been gone. Completely could have gone. been, yeah, completely blown up, I suppose. Or uh, could have been just unlivable. But yeah, I mean, you see that kind of a thing in hundreds and hundreds of different uh, sci-fi stories. You mentioned Wally a second ago, and that's, I guess that's kind of similar to this story in that the world had kind of turned into one giant Walmart. In that case, you know, Earth was used up. I'd say it was more of a Kmart, <laughs> the condition of the Earth. <laughs> I remember one time you and I went to a Walmart <laughs> that was so shitty, we said <laughs> it looked like a Kmart. Yeah, I remember that. I think that was when we went to Comic-Con. We stopped in at one, and you're just like, wow, this is like a Kmart. That reminds me, uh, we still haven't gotten together and talked about Comic-Con. Oh, that's right. We haven't gotten together and recorded in, has it been a month? It could have been. It's been a long time. You were going on your vacation for, what, a week and a half? Just a week, but yeah. And then I think the day that you came home, 
I was leaving for my vacation. So, yeah. uh, and then there was one week when you were sick. Right now, your in laws are over, right? And they've just been there for months, right? <laughs> yeah, they've been here a while. Um, but hey, look, can we talk for a few minutes about our vacations and just throw it in here on this episode and get it out of the way, even though it will be in the long, distant past? It'll be uh, vacations that was by the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's do that. I'd like to hear. I, I, I'm sure you've had a lot of experiences that would be worth hearing about. Well, I, I don't know that I'd go that far. Um, but you, okay. you you, did go to Canada, right? I went to California. See, how did I think that you went to Canada? You know, my kids are like that. They have trouble because mommy's from Canada and daddy's from California. And a lot of times they confuse the two and mix them together. But I don't know why you decided it was Canada and not California. Well, I think you had said something along the lines of, uh, you know, if I have internet access, I'll talk to you. And, and I just had assumed that that was Canada because I remember when you went last year, you had nothing to do right? but sit around because there was no computer. There was no whatever else people do with their lives. But yeah, we went to California. We had a family reunion. We uh, hung out for a week and we had a creek running through the campground that we were at and everybody just played in the water and had a good time. Nothing much to it. But you went to Comic-Con, right? I did. But and I'm assuming that you saw some stuff that was worth reporting back on. Well, see, it's hard to say uh, how much uh, in detail you want me to go and, and if the, the listeners want to hear any of it. But you and I have talked a couple of times since I got back, and I always say, oh, I want to tell you something, but I'm not going to until we record, because I guess I don't want to bore you or... I don't want to expend the oxygen of telling the story twice. I'm not really sure why. And now it's time for Tell Me a Story, Mommy, with Rish Outfield. Yeah, the, the, the last time you and I went together, it was kind of miserable for you. <laughs> you said, yeah, uh, I'm not going again. I'm going to pretend I have family reunions from now on. And then last year I went without you. And the lines were really unbearable and it was hot and unpleasant and I wasn't able to get into the panels that I wanted to get into. And yeah, there was a little while that I felt like, gosh, I'm not sure I'm going to do this anymore. But this year, I, I don't feel that way at all. I still feel like they're very disorganized and I still feel like there's way more people than need to be there. But I had a good time and I was able to get into what I really wanted to see. And, and maybe that made the difference. That does make a huge difference because I remember the last time that I went, I didn't get into anything that I wanted to see. Everything that I wanted was scheduled at the exact same time as the other things that I wanted. And I would have to choose one or the other. And invariably, the one that I did choose had a gigantic line and I was unable to get into that one either. And so I'm guessing that you didn't have so much the same problem. Well, of course, there were still lines and there were hours that I stood in line. Uh-huh. There's no way around that. But this year I had a laptop and whenever I was stuck in a line for a long time, you know, I would turn it on and flip it open and either start to blog or surf the Internet or, or write. And uh, I got to say that made the time fly by or, or at least it, it, my perception of time. And so that might have something to do with it. But also just, yeah, the fact that I was able to get into the Hall H stuff on Saturday that I wanted to see. And that was really nice. And, right. And how I did that was I just got up really early in the morning and drove over there and got in the line and just decided that I would spend the whole day there. I wasn't going to leave the room. I wasn't <laughs> going to go out to eat. I had made myself a bunch of sandwiches. They were in my backpack. I had brought a bunch of drinks. <laughs> I, was, I was there for the long haul. So I ended up being there from 7 in the morning until about 11 o'clock at night. There were still about a thousand people in line ahead of me, which are all more dedicated people than me. I see. I'm I'm really really bad at mornings. I hate mornings. I hate getting up. But seven o'clock wasn't. Well, I, I mean, I got up at six something so I could get there at seven. That wasn't so bad. I had considered getting up at four because I had talked to some guys that were like, "Oh, we're just going tonight. We're gonna go get some food and then come back here and then just you know take our sleeping bags." And and I thought, "You silly bastards." Or people that hey, real, real quick, before you go on, let's explain to folks just what exactly Hall H is and what it is that you were camping out for or not camping out for. Okay, good point. 
I, and yeah, I just assumed that everybody knows what I'm talking about, but but of course they don't. Yeah, Comic Con is something they hold every single year, and it used to be just about comic books, but now it's much more about geek centric entertainment. Uh, television, movies, and comic books, and video games. And on Saturday, the day that the most people show up, that's the day that the big movie studios tend to have their unveiling of who's going to be in what, or new footage, or new trailer, or let's meet the cast and crew of something. And they always do it on Saturday, and it's always in Hall H, which is a great big auditorium that holds, I think, 5,000 people. And last year... And the year before, I spent a long time in the line for Hall H, but ultimately didn't get to go to the panels that I wanted to. And I blamed that on Twilight. Because <laughs> last year it was the big movie two and three panel. And the year before that, it's like, oh, wow, we've got a movie coming out based on Twilight. And let's meet these incredibly attractive people that, that aren't Kristen Stewart. And so I just blamed them. Because if you recall, well, and maybe you don't, maybe you haven't been to enough to notice just how many squealy teen and preteen girls there were at Comic-Con 2008. And there were just as many in 2009. Tons of really, really loud teenage girls that were looking at us. Well, the way that teenage girls always look at, at fat, balding geeks. They were looking down on us, even though they were there, too. It's like, hey, you're dressed as Sailor Moon, too, lady. <laughs> but that was not the case this year because there's no... There's no Twilight movie right. in the works until next year. Yeah, they're holding off for a while, right? I guess. You're the one that's in the know on those. Really. Okay. But I was able to get into what I wanted to see, and I don't know if it's a coincidence or not, but if I have to blame anyone for me not getting in before, it was the Twilight people, and, and I'm comfortable with that. So this year around, you got there at 7. Right. And there was a long line of about 1,000 people already, and I just went through the twisty, turny labyrinth of people until I got to the end, and then I just sat down. And the people around me either sat or laid down and went to sleep because the doors open at 10 o'clock. And again, how wonderfully organized this thing was. The first panel wasn't till 11.15. Why they wait an hour and 15 minutes before anything happens, I can't guess. That is kind of weird. So I had three hours of just sitting there before the doors even opened. And the first interesting thing that happened was that there was some kind of commotion, the first commotion of the day. And people were yelping and, and making a noise. And, and I guess a rat had come and was like scampering among the garbage cans. You know, then a person would jerk and, and the rat would run away. Anyway, it climbed over the woman that was sitting next, that was sleeping next to me. Uh -huh. And she just, yeah, freaked <laughs> out. You know, one of those where she was on her feet in a second, flailing and, and screaming. And that was before she even knew it was a rat. She just, <laughs> you know, knew that something had been on her. And I tried to comfort her by saying that it was a it was a cute rat. It was it was friendly. Maybe it had escaped from a, a carnival or something. It was but. it was Remy. Come on, he washes his hands. It was voiced by Patton Oswald, but she didn't know who that was. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. And the other thing about the line was this year at this Comic Con, Morgan Spurlock was doing a documentary following uh, some people around going to the panels, just showing like a year in the life of Comic-Con or, or a weekend in the life of Comic-Con or something like that. Okay. Uh, you know who Morgan Spurlock is? I don't. Now, he's a documentarian. He he got an Academy Award nomination for Super Size Me. Oh, it's that guy? Yes, this was the douchebag that ate at McDonald's three times a day for you know, six months and then dared to say that it made him unhealthy. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, wow. And you know what? Setting yourself on fire can hurt yeah it, it can even give you burns who would have guessed let's make a documentary about that anyhow so just right in front of me directly in front of me was this geeky 20 something kid with an underbite in a purple t-shirt that happened to be a or the subject of their documentary he was a dark-haired skinny kid uh -huh. if you close your eyes and imagine a game of dungeons and dragons being played he is one of the people playing the game. Okay. And I can see him now. There was a film crew, sound people and a lighting guy that were following this kid around as part of this documentary. 
And I looked at him for a minute and I was just like, oh, you know, this guy represents all that is evil in the world. And then his girlfriend came up and she was also dressed in purple with some coffee for him. And they like embraced and the cameras, you know, made sure to get the embrace. And and I was insanely jealous of this guy. <clears throat> so <laughs> as the line finally started to move, for some reason, this guy in purple, because he was part of the film crew, didn't have to stand in the line. And so they just sort of moved him and I gnashed my teeth and wished bowel cancer on the guy and uh, figured I'd never see him again. Then once those doors opened, we all got inside. We all took our seats and then we had to wait another hour before anything happened. But there were several panels of people showing footage from uh, Green Lantern, for example. Ryan Reynolds was there. Oh, yeah. And, uh, How was the footage? Was it good looking stuff? It was. Uh, well, I, you know, I, I don't think there was any footage of him in the costume. And people have complained that the costume looks awful. Uh huh. But in the footage that we saw, he was just test pilot Hal Jordan. And we see him in an alley fighting some thugs just in his regular clothes. But he makes one of those energy fists out of green light. And, you know, it's CG, but it looked really like you would imagine it does in the comic books. Now, I, I'm not a huge Green Lantern fan. Are you? Green Lan I've read a few. I had a friend who is a big Green Lantern fan, and he kept feeding me a bunch of Green Lantern trades so i read a few but uh, i kind of ran out of time to read because i had to read all of the submissions for a while and so he got upset with me for not reading more of his green lantern but i have read a little bit and i've seen what it looks like in the comics i, I think i know what you're talking about a big kind of glowing green fist okay well i'm only vaguely aware of green lantern and very very recently but it's it's up my alley it seems like the kind of stuff i would like and uh I especially like Sinestro, this character of Sinestro. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, Mark Strong is playing him in this movie, and he had shaved his head. And I don't know what he'll look like in the movie because we didn't see any footage with Mark Strong in it, with Sinestro in it. Uh -huh. Do you know who Mark Strong is? I don't think so. Does he play something that I would know? Did you see the 2009 Sherlock Holmes? I did. Okay, he was the villain in that. Oh, movie. he was that big British dude? Well, I don't know that he was big, but he was the main bad guy in that. Right, the one that hanged and then but didn't really die and all that. Yeah, I know who you're talking about then. Okay. And he's also the villain in Kick-Ass, uh, which I don't imagine you've seen either, but I think you should watch it with your daughters because they need role models. Ah, uh, okay. Anyhow, he, he plays Sinestro, but apparently Sinestro is not the villain in this, in this movie. Oh, interesting. Um, I think they're hoping to make a whole bunch of these Green Lantern flicks <laughs> okay. and Sinestro will take his rightful place as the villain in the next movie. Cool. I we'll like that when they do stuff like that. Yeah, I do too. Um, there's nothing worse than when uh, one of these superhero movies tries to handle three or four subplots at the same time or major plots at the same time, you know, because it's like, oh, no, we won't get another chance at this, Admiral. Right. I like all the stuff that Daredevil had. Right. Yeah, when that movie ended, I never wanted to see another Daredevil. <laughs> or you get a Spider-Man 3 or an X-Men 3 type thing. Yeah. She, I've been talking for a long time. So there were several panels, uh, and we saw footage from, for example, Harry Potter, uh, Let Me In, Resident Evil, Pi. I think they've run out of numbers for those Resident Evil movies. <laughs> um, a, a movie called Sucker Punch that Zack Snyder is doing. But I think a lot of the people in the auditorium were there for the Marvel panel, which was at, toward the end of the day. Or I think it was scheduled for like six o'clock or seven o'clock. Okay. Night. People would get up and leave in between panels, but I, I would imagine that it was full long before that Marvel panel. At one point, sort of in the middle of the day. Oh, wait, let me start over. Early on, there was a little bit of commotion. Commotion number two. At the front of the room, and people were standing up and taking pictures and gawking. And I guess one of the actors from Dexter, that Showtime show, had come in and just sat down with the rest of us. Okay. And so people were like, ooh, neat, autograph, let's get a lock of his hair. I got his underwear. You did? And wow, nice work. Yeah, well, eBay. <laughs> <laughs> and so that is merely set up for later in the day, there was a much bigger commotion at the back of the room. And there was noise and there was hubbub 
for lack of a real word. Ooh, uh, and, you know, if you stood up or if you looked, there were just so many people over there uh, gawking or standing up or, or standing on their chairs or rubbernecking, you know, trying to figure out what was going on over there that I just assumed, oh, another celebrity came in. I wonder who that was. A minute or 10 later, somebody got on the intercom and said, okay, folks, everybody take your seats. Everything is under control. Just sit back down, please. Everything is fine. Which led me to wonder, well, gosh, what was that? What was going on there in the back? A question that I would never know the answer to. <laughs> so the rest of the, well, the panels went on. Started. <laughs> thanks for sharing the story. I've been deliberately wasting your time. Yes, you are. My cousin went to Comic-Con. I didn't. I just thought it would be fun to pull your leg. <laughs> so a few minutes later, they make another announcement. They say, okay, everything has been taken care of, folks. Uh, everybody go back to your seats, and we will try and get everything back on schedule. And somebody came up to the microphone and said, uh, while we get everything taken care of in the back, we're going to show all these trailers. And so we sat down and we watched. And some of them were very geek-centric, like the Scott Pilgrim one or the Green Hornet one. Okay. And then there were others like Never Let Me Go or Charlie St. Cloud. They just happen to be movies that are coming out that don't really appeal to our to us. But, uh -huh. but you know, it's, it's, it's trailers. I didn't really realize at the time what was going on, but what was happening was that they were killing time while they were taking care of something. Uh -huh. And the only trailer I really wanted to talk about is for a movie called Devil. Oh. And it's a horror flick about a bunch of people that get into a, an elevator on a high rise and then it stops. And it turns out that one of the people isn't a person at all, but some kind of demon. Ooh. And I thought it was a very scary, very effective trailer. So uh, the, I, I was really into this trailer, and I feel like the audience was too. And then at the very end of the trailer, it said, From writer, writer executive writer, producer, writer, M. Night Shyamalan. Shyamalan. And dude, the audience turned like a rabid dog. There was booze, there was hissing, there were cat calls. If there had been popcorn to throw, it would have flown through the sky. Rotten tomatoes. And uh, I was amazed at this reaction. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's what a general audience response would be. Um, but, oh, it was so negative that uh, if, you know, if there's a studio exec in the room or somebody who heard talk of this, I think you'd probably want to trim that uh, that little blurb from the end of your trailer. But it's just amazing that he was on top of the world a mere decade ago. And now, I guess, have you ever been in a theater and a trailer played and people booed? Uh, I don't think so. I can't remember any. I think on Friday you said the, the beach trailer. Right. No, I was, I went, when we talked about that, I was talking about a apocryphal story that I've once heard. I don't know the uh, origin of this story or whether it's true at all. This was, you know, shortly after Titanic had come out and become the be-all, end-all of creation. And then, a few years later, Star Wars Episode One came out. And uh, The Beach was a trailer that they ran at the start. And Leo DiCaprio was the... Uh, lead actor in that movie and now this is a, like i said is a story i have no idea where this actually happened i think it could have happened though because i know how sick and tired everybody was of leonardo dicaprio at that time but yeah the beach trailer came on and everybody just started booing getting all upset and then they started a chant where they went leo sucks leo, leo sucks. sucks leo, leo sucks. sucks and uh that you know this happened in la and Leonardo DiCaprio just happened to have snuck in in disguise, you know, with his hat pulled down over his, his eyes to see Star Wars Episode One, And he happened to be in the theater that these folks got so incensed and started shouting him down. I don't know if that's true. I get the feeling that it's probably not. But well, uh, if, if it was true, would that ruin the film for you? Would he not be able to enjoy Jar Jar's antics after that? <laughs> You know, if I if I was Leo, then definitely I think it would have. I probably wouldn't want to stick around in that theater, considering how antagonistic they were towards him. What if somebody looked over and said, hey, you look an awful, your coat looks brownish in hue. It was on sale. <laughs> 
you know, you know, you got a, 200 people screaming about how you suck. You don't want to stand up and have suddenly a riot as they beat you to death. You know, it might be a good idea to just go ahead and leave at some point kind of quietly during that showing if you really were Leo DiCaprio and that really did happen. Okay, well, I just wanted to mention that thing about the devil trailer. I don't know at this point if Shyamalan's career is irreparably damaged. My first inclination when there was that reaction was, I don't think this guy has another bridge to burn. You know, who knows? Movie might turn out to be fine or, you know, all, all, it'll, I, all it would take is one really good movie yeah. to get back in everybody's good graces. But I don't know. He, gets, he puts out another sixth sense and uh, yeah, he'd be probably pretty close to back where he was before. But, you know, how many directors are there that put their name on every single thing that they do? You don't hear about, like, Nora Ephron's next film as much as we like to make sure everybody knows about it. <laughs> Who was it that was a big fan of Nora Ephron? <laughs> that was ADRG that was a huge Nora Ephron fan. Yeah, we ought to get him back in here soon. <laughs> there was definitely something wrong with that bot. But, uh, you know, most directors don't do that, and he could just sink into that kind of obscurity... And sure, his name comes up when the credits roll, but it's not all marketed on the fact that he was the director and the writer and the whatever. He could go on for the rest of his life doing just fine like that, if you ask me, but maybe that's not enough for him since he exploded out of the gate when he started. It might be hard to go back and be the more obscure type of a person. I don't know if he'd be satisfied. It's like a child star, you know, like Gary Coleman or somebody who was a little kid and they were huge and they were so important. And then the show ends and they spend the rest of their life trying to regain that fame that they once had and they're miserable and hate their life because they never can. I don't know. I don't know either. After the trailers were all done, we had a panel for something called Paul, which is a new Simon Pegg nick frost movie um but they had said you know that hey oh i'm sorry we're an hour behind so you know we're going to try and get everything back on schedule as fast as we can okay so back to the marvel panel they decided to present captain america first and they'd only been shooting on that for a week or so oh shoot the the the, the big movie for me actually ended up being a complete and total surprise and it was a, a movie that John Favreau is doing for DreamWorks called Cowboys and Aliens. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm one of those guys that he's almost reached the end of the punchline. And then he says, oh, yeah, I forgot. One of the boys has a glass eye. Yeah, I forgot to say that. Just I, I'm, I'm not a good storyteller, am I? No. Okay, uh, Cowboys and Aliens. This is a new movie by John Favreau, who directed Iron Man, as you know. Apparently, it's one of those indie comic books that you've never heard of, kind of like Kick Gas was or Road to Perdition or one of those. And, and then they make a movie and you're like, oh, that was a comic book. Cool. So Favreau came out. And to my surprise, he's fat again. Uh, really fat. You know, he'd lost all that weight in the post-production of Iron Man 1. It was on the documentaries. And to see him fat again, it filled me with some kind of joy or, or relief or I, I i'm not sure why i would have felt that way i don't know because you're evil you want them to die young of cholesterol related diseases see this isn't true <laughs> i'm just happy that he was fat you know people are generally happier when they're fat because then they don't have to worry about what they eat and that's just a happy life i'll tell you it's nice to be able to just eat and drink what you want of course it sucks when you just get fatter and fatter and fatter and more and more and healthier too though that double-edged sword that you often refer to. Too much, right? <laughs> well, Cowboys and Aliens, as you would guess from the title, is an underwater sea adventure. No, it's a Western sci-fi movie. Okay. And it, it stars Daniel Craig, who you would know as the new James Bond. Uh -huh. And then John Favreau brought out Daniel Craig, and he brought out the number 13 from House and a couple other cast members. And yeah, there was a big reaction when Daniel Craig came out because he's James Bond, you know, and right. this is a bunch of geeks. Right. And we were all happy to see him. And so they were about to sit down. And then John Favreau said, oh, and ladies and gentlemen, we have one more guest. 
Harrison Ford. Wow. And security brought Harrison Ford out in handcuffs and forced him to sit down on the panel. And the audience went absolutely nuts. It, it was it was a wave of excitement and a happy surprise because he, in all the years that Comic Con's been going on, has never showed up to one of these. He, you know, it's it's like pulling teeth for this guy even to sit down for an interview and to go sit in front of five thousand screaming fans, which I guess is the joke of uh, him being handcuffed and forced into it. Uh-huh. But oh, it was so cool. And yeah, I thought Daniel Craig is used to being. The center of attention, you know, any room he walks in and yet he didn't even get a third the response that this guy got. And uh, there was so much cheering and, and, and noise and all that stuff that it probably cut their panel down significantly. <laughs> and yeah, he just sat there uncomfortably and waited for the applause to end. But it was neat because they had all, they hadn't finished shooting this movie, but... John Favreau had shot a bunch of it and then sent it to ILM to do the special effects and said, can you finish the special effects on this sequence in time for Comic-Con? So we got to see a finished 10 minutes of the film. Wow. And this movie looked so up my alley because it is just like a straight Western. But instead of, you know, the Apaches coming and attacking this town, it's some kind of alien force. And, uh, I was so loving it. And yeah, I guess they've got a whole year before that sucker comes out too. So so I'm sure we'll see trailers and stuff and, and, and the audience can decide for themselves. And, and, you know, Westerns tend to be the kiss of death at the box office, but you know, hopefully this will be an exception. Well, it's got aliens in it, so that ought to change things a little. It's not your standard Western. We'll see. Anyhow, to make the, an excruciatingly long story only painfully long, the Marvel panel was there at the end of the night. They did Captain America first. And Captain America has only been shooting for a week or so, for 11 days or something like that. But we saw a sequence with the Red Skull before he's the Red Skull. Do you know Captain America well enough to know what the Red Skull's name is? Okay, hold on. I used to sell his figure. Ah, oh, Baron, I want a thing. I don't know what his name is, so I, it would have really surprised me if you did. Just say no and we'll move on. Okay. No, I do not know what his name is. That's fine. Do you know who's playing Red Skull? I don't. Uh, Hugo Weaving is playing Red Skull. Okay. Do you know who Hugo Weaving is? I don't. He was Elrond in the Lord of the Rings movies and oh, Agent okay. Smith in the Matrix films. Okay, I, I know who that is, yeah. And the scene that they showed us has to do with the Thor universe. So I thought that was funny that they just got it taken care of right off the bat. These are a shared universe movies. And then, yeah, Chris Evans came out, and he's uh, Captain America. The director came out, Joe Johnston. And they talked for a little bit and took some questions and answers, but uh, they didn't really have a lot of footage. They showed us a tiny bit of a costume test that they did with Chris Evans in the Captain America suit, and he threw the shield but I don't want to be one of those geeks that complains endlessly about how crappy the costume looks. So we'll just uh, hope that it looks good on film. Okay. But then after the Captain America panel, they had the Thor panel. And Thor is done, or very close to done. Uh-huh. So they, they took like a whole hour, I think, to talk about Thor. And Chris Hemsworth, who plays Thor, came out. Natalie Portman came out. Guy who plays Loki came out. Um, the director, Kenneth Branagh, came out. They talked and answered questions, and they showed us a trailer, uh, which has now been released on the internet, so you've seen that trailer as well. What did you think? It looked pretty good to me. It's always hard to judge from a uh, trailer, because every trailer looks great, and there's so many times that the trailer has just been way better than the uh, film itself, so... I don't know, but it looked pretty good to me. How much of the Thor mythos are you familiar with? I know more about Captain America than I do about Thor, so none. <laughs> I do know about Loki. I don't really know much about him, but that he's god of mischief or whatever. I'm similar. Uh, I think I know a little bit more about Thor than you do, but not much. 
And I've found that the more you know and more passionate you are about the minutia of these characters, the more bound you are to be disappointed. Yeah. But as far as Thor goes, because I know so little, I'm not going to say, oh, uh, Odin's eye patch is supposed to be on the left side, not the right. I'm not going to do any of that stuff. You're not going to go all Wallace Shawn on us? And... And, and we can't have that. You know, when I saw Loki with those horn, with that horned helmet, I was like, oh, cool. That's Loki. To me, you know, that that's all I need. But if somebody were a super diehard Thor fan, you know, maybe they would have issues with who's playing what or what something looks like. The horns aren't long enough or something. <laughs> that sort of thing uh, is something that geeks get upset about. So just like me being upset that there are no wings on Captain America's mask. Right. I'm just like, uh, you know, that's not Captain America. That's one of those other guys that looks kind of like Captain America. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that movie. The trailer that we saw uh, was in 3D. It's one of those that they, you know, didn't make it in 3D, but they're retrofitting it to be 3D, although they've got a whole year to work on it. So it's not going to be like Clash of the Titans, where, you know, it was right at the last minute they turned it into 3D. But I'm just so, so sick of 3D. Yeah, I'll not waste another dollar on it myself. It's a gimmick. Uh, it reminds me of when CG became the thing in the mid-90s, and you'd just see awful CG effects. Occasionally good CG effects, but uh, unnecessary. And you'd see them all the time and think, well, you know, they could have done that with just a guy in a suit. The awful CG effects were much more egregious, but just any time I see a trailer that says, see it in see 3D, it just, that doesn't appeal to me. It's a... I really like the commercial for uh, The Last Airbender where they'd say, Coming to Coming theaters, theaters in 3D. In 3D. Also available in 2D. <laughs> in case people didn't realize. I, I guess I'm getting old. Maybe they'll have to do that on all trailers now, but I can't see a kid or a young person that sees a lot of movies not being sick of it either. Because it really is just a... You know, like when Bullet Time came out, and for a year or two after Matrix, all these movies had Bullet Time. Eventually, they just stopped because they realized, okay, it's been done. It no longer wows. It, in fact, now it detracts from the entertainment. Yeah. Because people are like, oh, that again. I don't know. But uh, one of the things that John Favreau said that I was blown away by was, I'm going to make a promise that nobody else at Comic-Con is going to be able to say, there will be no 3D showings of my movie. <laughs> it's 100% 2D. And there were a lot of people besides me that clapped on that. So maybe it's fading. I understand the studios saying, wow, I get an extra $3 a ticket for every movie that we do in 3D. But ugh. yeah, there's nothing to it. I mean, if they were actually shooting in 3D, maybe it would be worth it. But nobody does. It's like Resident Evil is the first one. Right, I was going to say that Resident Evil was actually shot in 3D. And all the footage that we saw was in 3D. But to be honest, I would have gotten the exact same response in 2D. Right. But yeah, I just I hate to grouse and sound like an old guy or whatever. You know, it was better when they implied sex. They say, I think it was on Starship Sofa I was listening to it. They do a science news update over there. And... The science news update was why people get headaches when they watch 3D movies. And it's got a lot to do with how old you are and what your brain does with what your eye sees and how it makes it look 3D. And the older you are, you know, the worse your vision tends to get. And so your brain has to work a lot more to make this 3D effect that the projection is forcing into your mind. And so the older you get, the worse... 3D is for you and the more headachey it is and you know so since you're getting old it makes perfect sense okay well thank you I think <laughs> anyhow the Thor panel ended and uh, they said we're way way over time but if you'll just you know give us one more minute we've got something else we want to show you and the lights went down and they had a teaser trailer for the Avengers that was narrated by Samuel L. Jackson and then Sam Jackson came out, and he introduced Chris Evans as Captain America, Chris Hemsworth as Thor, Scarlett Johansson as Black Widow, the guy that plays Agent Coulson, <laughs> and Robert Downey Jr. came out. And I was amazed that Robert Downey Jr. came there for a three-minute <laughs> 
photo op, but he came up to the microphone. Sam Jackson stood down. He says, thank you, thank you. His people were going nuts because we didn't expect Robert Downey Jr. to show up. And he says, hey, don't anybody stab anybody, okay? And people laughed. And he introduced Joss Whedon, the director, and Joss came out. And, and then they introduced Jeremy Renner as Hawkeye and Mark Ruffalo as the new uh, Bruce Banner. <laughs> Mark Ruffalo, huh? Yeah, and they all stood together in a big line. It was the first time the Avengers had been assembled, and they said, yeah, we'll talk to you guys next year, but thank you, you know, this is the Avengers. And and, uh, and then they left, and the people were really excited about that, but yeah, yeah, I, I think I may have exaggerated when I said it was five minutes. It might have been like two minutes, two and a half minutes, or, <laughs> and then it was done, and, you know, the people were leaving, and filing out and uh, Avengers doesn't come out until 2012. So they've got a whole nother Comic-Con that they can rule next year. Right. And, you know, I imagine that there will be uh, footage and more than five minutes worth. Yeah. That just, they'll give them a whole panel probably but, or not, you know, but maybe there will be other projects in the making by then, you know, that, that will be announced and but we'll see. But the last thing of the night was a uh, Kevin Smith's, traditional filthy talk panel and usually he goes two or three hours because you know he, the guy can talk he got a saturday slot he always gets it's the, the end of saturday hall age which i think is normally like eight o'clock to 11 and in this case i think it was nine something to 11 yeah he came out and he's not really got anything that he was promoting but he just did q a but the first thing he said was how many of you guys have been here all day and, you know, a lot of people clapped and he's like, so how many of you guys saw the stabbing? And I had thought that Robert Downey Jr. was just making some kind of a joke. But what had happened in that big commotion was that two guys had gotten into an argument or a disagreement over a seat. I guess, you know, this is my seat or you said you'd save the seat or, you know, give me back my seat. And one of them pulled out a pen and stabbed the other one in the eye with it. Oh, my gosh. And so there was a huge hubbub and, you know, paramedics were called and helped this guy. And then the other guy, the, the stabber, was arrested. And that's why we had like an hour and a half of, of trailers stuff going on in the back, you know, and, and, and oh, hey, everybody take your seats and uh, watch this stuff. And we'll try and get back on schedule soon. But I had no idea what had happened because there were just so many people there and I wasn't in the area where it had happened. But that's what had happened. And when I went home that night, that was the the big news of Comic-Con was that rather than so-and-so presents so-and-so. Mark Ruffalo is Bruce Banner and any of that stuff. Right. So, uh, so that's what that big deal had been. And uh, anyhow... To, to finish the story, Kevin Smith took questions and answers, and I'm sure you've been to one of those before. You know, somebody gets up and asks him a question, then he talks for 20 minutes because everything is a lead-in to a great story. And uh, the first guy in the Q&A, the very first question, happened to be this geek in purple that had been in front of me in the line. Uh -huh. uh, the, 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 the camera crew was falling around. Uh -huh. And he asked Kevin a question, and Kevin spent five minutes answering it. And then the geek said, oh, and I have a question from my girlfriend. And he asked her question. And Kevin spent a couple minutes answering it. Then the geek said, thank you. I have one more question. And dude, it was M. Night Shyamalan all over again. The audience turned on this guy and booed and hissed and sit down and die. And they were brandishing their own pens <laughs> at this poor guy who had dared to ask a third question. Oh, and, and of course, all of this is on film. The camera crew is following this guy. At this point, there were two cameras on him, uh -huh. you know, which is amazing. And plus the regular Comic-Con camera. But the, the guy puts up his hand, you know, it's acknowledging the boos and hisses of, of everybody, telling him to sit down. And he's like, actually, this isn't a question for you, Kevin, but this is a question for my girlfriend. And he got down on one knee and he asked her to marry him. And suddenly... There was a 360 degree change in the room <laughs> of all these people, myself included, that were like, hey, sit down. I, uh, let somebody else ask a big question to just this amazing moment. Hence the cameras. Of course, they had already known this was going to happen, which is why the cameras were on him. But he asks this girl to marry him. She comes up and 
she accepts and they hug and the audience applauds a standing ovation. And Kevin is thinking it's great and asking her, you know, how big this guy's dong is and if he's good in the sack. You know how Kevin is. Yes, I do. And, you know, he asks them where they met. And they met last year at Comic-Con, a year ago. Oh, yeah. And here they're getting (laughs) engaged at Comic-Con. And Kevin said, hey, you guys, why don't you have the wedding reception next year at my panel? Oh, yeah. And I'm sure the girl is like, oh, uh, we don't do that kind of stuff. I'm. I'm a geek in name only. (laughs) But Kevin is like, I'll go and get my minister's license and I will perform this ceremony. And of course, the (laughs) geeks in the room are just eating this up. And it's like, oh, this sounds great. And he says, and I'll have Jason Mewes throw your bachelor party. (laughs) And uh, the geek in question didn't, uh, I don't think he accepted, but it certainly would be a high profile thing if he did. But yeah, just the the sentiment in the room was really positive and, and everybody was really happy. And uh, it was it was a sweet moment. It was a really nice way to end the day. And it bookended the whole experience of, of that Saturday at Comic-Con for me, because I started out with this guy and ended not exactly with this guy, but, you know, something related to this guy. Uh-huh. And uh, I'm sure when that documentary is made, that that will be the high point of the whole documentary. Right. Unless, of course, they caught the stabbing on film. (laughs) There you go. There were three other days of Comic-Con, but Saturday was the big day, and it was the most fun and the most interesting, and the one I most wanted to talk to you about. And uh, I think you would have had a good time, too. Yeah, it sounded like you really did it right. When we went for the Hall H stuff, we didn't make it into anything, if I remember right, in 2008, but we wanted to go to six other things that were scheduled at the same time. We tried to go back and forth and spent a bunch of time in line and no time in panels. I think uh, you definitely did it the right way and just bring in the sandwiches, bring in some water, and just being there for the long haul. I, I know you know how this is, but you sort of become friends with the people around you in the line. You know, it's like so-and-so needs to go to the bathroom. Oh, don't worry, I'll save your spot. Uh-huh. Making jokes and commenting and things and did you have to get up and go to the bathroom while you were in the uh, Hall H, or did you just bring a bottle that you could, you know? Uh, I have no funny response to that question. Um, <laughs> there were restrooms in Hall H, so uh, yeah, but w- there was a long winding line outside of the restrooms. I can't even imagine what the ladies' room. Was. Ladies' room would have been empty. It was ghost town. Good, good point. Yeah. <laughs> wow, women at Comic Con? <laughs> what are you smoking? I, I'm much more willing to go back when I've had a positive experience. Um, if it had gone one more day, I would have been fine with it this year. Wow. Delightful. Speaking of delightful, I believe my story has finally come to an end. It's about bloody time! <laughs> um, this is why you don't have a Parsec Award, Rish. You know, it's funny you should mention that, announcer man. Yeah, where the hell were you during the rest of our conversation? <laughs> no, never mind. I appreciate you not being I here. think he was going for a smoke break. <laughs> See what you did there? <laughs> he used his words against him, spirit. But yeah, speaking of Parsecs, it so happens that they've put out their uh, list of Parsec-nominated shows recently. And Wait, wait. What are the Parsec Awards? Oh, awards given out for speculative fiction podcasts. So is it fair to say that the Parsec Awards are the Oscars in the podcasting world? They're the Oscars of the speculative fiction podcasting world. But uh, it's safe to say there's probably 500,000 podcasts out there that don't involve speculative fiction, I would guess. Oh, I mean, I don't know. I, they're like the Hugos of the podcasting world, maybe. Oh, okay. That works. Unless you're at Starship Sofa. And the Hugos are the Hugos of the podcasting world. Right. But uh, it turns out this time around that they uh, nominated us for a Parsec Award. Can you believe it? I, I can't. What about all the nasty things I constantly say about the Parsec Awards? Do do they not take those into account? I guess they didn't listen to the rest of the shows, just the one that we submitted as our uh, sample. That's my guess. Well, thank goodness. (laughs) Because what is the category? The, the, The category is Best Speculative Fiction Story Short Form. And what episode was that? A Princess of Earth by Mike Resnick. 
the rules for this category or whatever f- for us to just be a story and not an audio drama it had to be two people or less doing the uh, story on this so that's why we chose this story in particular because this was a story where it was just me and rish and no one else involved it's got to be about the only story that we have out there that is such a story so uh yeah i submitted it for that category and uh apparently they liked it enough to uh make it one of the final five nominees well that's great more importantly Gresnik sent us an email congratulating us and he said we could do another story by him. yeah that'll be fun so to me that's it's an honor enough uh, or yeah the parsec awards we don't have to win we just we got something out of it already yeah we've got a really great reward already out of it but yeah so we're up against uh, a peter watts story called the things a tim pratt story that was on podcastle called restless in my hand uh, Gabrielle Harboy did a swimming lesson story, and then a Scott Sigler story called The Tank. We're up against all of those. I don't know how good of a chance we have to win or not, but it's an honor just to get Mike Resnick to let us do another story of his, so that's good enough for me. Cool. And I, I don't suppose we will know until s- when are Dragon Con, right? Yeah, Dragon Con, and I believe it is the uh, first weekend of September or something like that. I think it's Labor Day weekend, I think they do that. So that's when we'll find out. So are you considering going to uh, Atlanta to pick up the award? Should we win it? Oh, hell no, Big Anklevich. <laughs> Has Comic-Con spoiled you for uh, Dragon Con? No, it's just, uh, that's very far away, and... Uh... I don't imagine that we will win and uh, I wouldn't want to go by myself if you were going or, you know, we we were going to do a road trip and and end the road trip with Dragon Con. That would be worth it. But uh, no, I'm I'm okay not to. You heard it here first, folks. We will not be at Dragon Con. (laughs) Wait, wait. Do you feel differently? No, I can't go, man. A, I don't have money to go, which it would cost a lot of to get all the way to Atlanta. And uh, B... I only have so much vacation a year to use as well, so not going to happen, unfortunately. I'd like to. Is there a physical Parsec? I don't know. Truth, I don't think I've ever seen a picture of it. So I'm on their website and I don't see it. Well, we, I've talked a lot, so I don't feel like it's my turn to say anything, but it is really cool that uh, we've been nominated. We do work hard on the show. I think that that was a particularly good episode, but... It's hard to uh, to pick a, a, a favorite episode or say that one is better than another. Right. Yeah, I, I suppose that we could have been nominated for Uberman the year before in that same category. But I think they're creating new categories or new rules for the categories all the yeah, time. Yeah, I think they added that rule in that it had to be two or less people just this year. But uh, if anybody uh, out there votes for the Parsecs, uh, you know, we'd appreciate your vote. But also... If anybody out there helped us get nominated, that's 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 great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, we've talked a lot and not a lot of it about open 24 hours. Part of the difficulty is just uh, the length of time between recording a story and then doing the episode about it. And that tends to hurt us, I think. You're welcome to bring up something we didn't bring up in the comments and uh, remind us. Yeah. We'd love to continue discussing things in the comments, for sure. We're going to try and get back on track as far as uh, episodes hitting. Uh, I, I Yeah, I don't think I really said anything, but I tried to edit Open 24 Hours so that you could edit another story and we could get caught up. Um, next week, I think we've got a story edited by neither of us. So hopefully uh, that will put us on a more, more timely posting schedule. Yeah, be coming along. Uh, hey, I just want to remind everybody that uh, that little contest that I put on the blog, which is, we've mentioned to people that we have a blog now. Yeah, we think we did that last week, so we're safe. Oh, well, on the contest, I put a bunch of pictures on there, and that's still open, but I'm going to end it for our next episode, okay? Yeah, so good. if if you want to go through there and guess who all these people are, well, really, why would you want to do that at this point? Comic-Con was six years ago, but still... It's over there. It's dunesteef.blogspot.com. 
or you right. can just click the link from our regular Dune Steve page. That's right. And uh, yeah, check it out. We've got some good guesses already. Sasquatch in a suit, I think, is one of the guesses. Uh, I love one of the pictures. Of, I don't know how this could possibly have happened, but it looks like the person is half eaten away. It's like that movie Time Traveler's Wife, I think. That's how he would go into the past. His body would sort of crumble apart and then it would reappear in other times and and it looks like this guy's halfway through time traveling in the picture it's pretty cool i have no idea who the picture is of though (laughs) but it looks cool all the same i guess people could uh, donate if they wanted to and really we spend that money on buying stories and paying for server costs but it would be nice if somebody donated and i just bought a new camera with it i don't know why i even said that it's not gonna uh. all right also, another thing that we wanted to mention real quick, Rish got a gig on somebody else's show. What was the deal with it? Oh, are you talking about the Cast Macabre one? Yeah, the one that I was not involved in. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, I, I, were, I just don't... You were don't, a douche about it, what could I say? I just don't know the deal because I wasn't part of it. I'm not upset. There's a horror podcast that just does short horror stories, uh, very much like the one Alistair Stewart runs, and it's called Cast Macabre, and... And Barry Northern, the webmaster or host or whatever you want to call it. I think he's called Crypt Master. Oh, okay. The Dungeon Master, if you will, (laughs) emailed and said that it was one that is distinctly American and he needed somebody who could do a passable American accent. And and I don't know that yours really is passable. Yeah, people see through it every time. You get a bit of brogue in there. Yeah. But he had me read this story, The Nice Guy, by John Jasper Owens. And then he had our friend, friend of the show, Julie Meg, Meg Tilly, Julie Hoberson. <laughs> Meg Tilly. I'm sorry. Jennifer Tilly. She's my preferred Tilly sibling. Oh, okay. What the hell? Oh, then he had uh, Julie do the voice of the female character, and he edited it all together at a speed that can only be described as Kryptonian. He is a crypt keeper after all. That's so. right. Kryptonian. I think I got it for him on Friday and like... Saturday morning, it was all edited together with music and the different voices and an intro and an extra and, and, and ready to listen to, which is sort of par for the course for the things Julie does, but not for us. Uh, so you can check that out if you'd like. It's at www.castmacabre.org. If you're a uh, fan of Bart Simpson, it's spelled macabre, castmacabre.org. That's right. Macabre. Yes. Macabre is how it's pronounced if you have the broke that's right a, a relative of da- doug mike and tree what doug is it? mike and tree well all right i guess that's our show today then yes thank you for listening all the way through and uh thank you edward for sending us another story and i hope you feel like we did it justice all right i'm big anklevich and i'm rich outfield see you later folks and good night bye At the Dune Steve, we pay our authors as well as our own bills for the website maintenance and the like, so if you're ever in a generous mood, or even if you're not, we'd love it if you donate. Just press the button on the website to donate $5 a month, a quarter, or choose your own one-time donation amount. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, so you can give it to anyone but you cannot change it or make money off it. So long, and thanks for all the fish. Take two. A chime sounded, demanding his attention. Uh, Strange chime. (laughs) I love it. Whoa, dude, don't vomit on my mic, all right? Sorry, sir. Open 24 Hours by Edward McEwen. McEwen, that's what it was, yeah. So I got it right the first time? Yeah, but you might want to say it with a little more... Dignity? Or confidence. Oh. No one will sleep with me. How much confidence could I have? Tars Bokara shuffled down the dusty corridors of the Mechal... Mechaleka High, Mecca Heine Ho Museum. Mechaleka High, Mecca Chani Ho Museum. Oh, well, you had to go there, didn't you? Well, you went there first. I wasn't going to Chani. Racist.
He looked about at the Rigelian mummies and Arcturian flayed skins with Rigelian. That's an actual word. Lick my Rigelian. Uh... The assignment pool computer sent him to the Medicala Museum. Sent in I think he said Medicala the first time. What did I say this time? Medicala. Like a Canadian. <sighs> you take that back. The line must be drawn here. Here and no further. The curator looked the part of field archaeologist. Tanned. Tall. Tall. Tanned. With a broad, sloping forehead. With a broad... <laughs> Broad, that's awesome. The curator looked the part of a field right. Since the great diaspora, let me say that again. Mm. Since the great diaspora, mm. since the great diaspora after the cluster war. Cluster what? Fuck. Oh. Uh, you won't need much in the way of luggage. Uh, things in space tend to uh not be worn and that's fine and we'll give you some kind of catheter so that you can relieve yourself the robot may help in that depends on its classification the robot started the engine and gumpina's shuttle kicked free uh, Heading... it says engines with an s which you did not say uh. and one steer us steer for a landing on a clear area somewhere oh, damn this is hard to say Steer for a landing on a clear area somewhere on that northern continent where the lights are thickest. Mr. Sulu, steer for a landing on a clear area somewhere on that northern continent where the lights are thickest. And one, steer for a landing on a clear area somewhere in that northern continent where the lights are the thickest. Followed by a two meter tall, blue, yellow, and green chitinous horror, waving antennae and, and claws. Wait, oh, say chitinous. Come on, say chitinous. I would rather, but it's not pronounced that way. <laughs> You want to be the cockroach? What would a cockroach voice sound like? <laughs> no idea. Uh, how about, welcome to Earth, Mart? Sure. Do you want to do that, or do you want me to? Uh, I don't know. Oh, we're going to have so much fun with these outlandish voices. First customer we've had on the planet in 5,000 years. Is that terribly annoying? Or is no, that... I like it. I wanted it to be very it, over the top. It sounds like Steve Ely. <laughs> whenever it's like an old man or a teacher or a female character that's the maybe we should get steve ely to do the voice for us then i'm gonna hear you do a rap voice new york accent <clears throat> but new roach snapped a particularly large rat thanks Anne is my ticket home he patted her silver posterior that's an ass for you could you scratch behind my ears instead? <laughs> the cat lovers are going to be like, How dare you? You made him sound lazy and insolent and British and fat and gay. His hollow monitor bleeped with an incoming hyperlight call. His hollow monitor bleeped with an incoming hyperlight call. His hollow monitor bleeped with an incoming hyperlight call. <laughs> His hollow monitor bleeped with an incoming hyperlight claw. I almost made it. Ah, oh, crap. Sound? You can hear the radio? Yeah, it's starting to It's come. a theme from Mannequin this time, isn't it? Oh, what was that? We're on our way, or we're... I can't remember. It was a Jefferson... Or a, not Jefferson. It was just a starship by then. Okay, it starts with an N. Let's see if you can get it. Nothing's going to stop us now. That is correct. For $400. Thank you. Open 24 hours. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> if you okay. know what I yeah. mean. <laughs> John Favreau came out, and I was so happy to see that he's fat again. I guess that's Schadenfreude, but it's, uh, if Peter Jackson came out at a panel and he was fat again, I'd be like, oh, hey, cool. Explain to me why I would feel that way. Evil. evil, 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 evil. I, I'm much more willing to go back when I've had a positive experience. Um, huh. It was better. It was easier. Oh, and one other thing that you would have loved was it was overcast and actually raining wow. most of the weekend. So it wasn't super, super hot. It was pretty muggy and humid, but... Uh, 
but it wasn't sunny and, and, and roasting, and, and that uh, can be terrible when you have a mile or two to walk from your car to your car. You know? That would have been nice, because, yeah, we did a lot of walking. On my first day, on Thursday, I bought all this stuff, so I had tons of bags and, you know, just weighing me down, huge bags and luggage, practically. During the, the day, I turned and I, I went to walk back to my car, and somehow I had made a wrong turn, and there ended up being a fence, an uncrossable fence where the train yard is, and there was no way I could get to my car. And I realized I was going to have to go all the way back to the convention center and go around this fence and then go back to my car, which would have been another mile and a half or so. And if you recall, whenever we've gone, there have been these guys on like little rickshaws attached to bicycles. Yeah. There just so happened to be one. And he said, oh, you need to ride to your car? And I said, yes, I'm, I'm on uh, Sigby and Main Street. And he's like, ah, ah, yes, Sigby and Main. Ah, yeah, come on, my friend. And I said, uh, well, hey, hey, how much is it going to be? And he says, seven dollar. Like, wow, seven dollars. That's a lot of money. But uh, by this point, my feet hurt so bad and I was so sweaty. And I can't even express how many bags I had. I, I said, fine. Uh, we loaded up my stuff and I got on this little, little rickshaw and the guy started to pedal. And we'd gone three or four blocks. And then finally, the guy pulled the bike over uh, and there was a guy standing on the corner. And he says, hey, my friend, do you know where Sigby Street is or Main Street? And the guy said, oh, yeah, yeah, it's just you know, two more blocks over and you make a right. So we went two more blocks over and we made a right and we came up to my car and the guy stopped the little rickshaw and he says, $20. And I said, whoa, 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 you, you told me $7. And he said, no, no, you are very far away. You're, you're parking very, very far away, $20. And dude, I was so, so angry. <laughs> I mean, I was angry because I had, was so hot and tired and covered with bags and, you know, how Comic-Con is with all the people and the lines and the, the idiots. But I was just like, okay, look, I'll, I'll give you 10. And he's like, no, 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 no. You are very far away. He had the temerity to get upset with me and where I happened to have parked. You are very far away, $20. Uh -huh. And in the end, I was afraid, well, this guy knows my car that something is going to happen to my car unless I pay this guy his money. Right. So that, that sucked, I think it's fair to say. But uh, it makes for a delightful story, so it's all worth it. In the, in, in, yes. In, I don't know that I'd go that far. Delightful. Speaking of delightful, do you, let, let's end this episode. 